What if politics weren't to blame for the institutional corruption, the endless wars and the burgeoning homelessness? What if rather these are all just symptoms born out of an outdated social structure? That's the revolutionary idea behind the explosive Zeitgeist documentary trilogy. Since the first movie's release in 2007, these documentaries have been translated into 40 different languages and have been seen by hundreds of millions of people around the world. But the ideas brought forward by the documentaries quickly transcended film and spawned the Zeitgeist Movement, a global sustainability advocacy organization that's revolutionizing the way people think and act. And now, the filmmaker will be re-energizing the movement with yet another series titled Inner Reflections. Here to talk about the culture and decline, the Zeitgeist Movement, and where there may be a glimmer of hope, I'm joined by the filmmaker himself, Peter Joseph. Peter, thanks so much for coming on. Well, it's my pleasure, Abby. Thank you for having me. First of all, I just wanted to say that I think that these movies should be essential viewing for everyone on the planet because you really present these concepts that are much, not so much new or revolutionary as they are just glaringly obvious truths in the way that you articulate them, Peter. But I wanted to get into how you got all started. I mean, as someone who had worked in Wall Street and advertising, when did you step back and analyze your own role in society and decide to radically change course? Uh, great question. It was a it was a slow evolution, really. I like many people brought up in this culture. You end up with a self-interest driven mechanism. I came from a middle class family. We had no real wealth, and I came into the world. I went to school. I dropped out due to debt problems, of course, like many do today in the educational uh, college career problem that we have. Which you know, most college debt is the peak of bankruptcy, coupled with medical debts in, in aggregate. And I began to realize that there's something going on with the system. I moved and did stuff with Wall Street and advertising again, trying to keep my self-preservation going. And finally, it dawned on me when I made this catharsis film in 2007 called Zeitgeist, just called Zeitgeist, excuse me, which became Zeitgeist the movie. And it was a frustration piece that I made when I it just sort of exploded in my mind, almost to the extent that I don't even know where it came from, to be perfectly frank with you. It was a big catharsis that I did, which I threw up online. It became viral because I think people identified with the same issues and themes, and then that triggered basically where I am today, and I continue to move forward with representative media that is both entertaining and, and uh, value shifting in the quality that it pursues, but also extremely educational and ultimately activist oriented, and that's the whole purpose of my existence at this point. Nice. Thanks for explaining that. So, so let's get right into this. With the elections coming up in less than two weeks, let's talk about the two-party system, which you explore a little bit in a recent video that you made called What Democracy? What purpose does this system serve to control the population? I mean, do you advocate people to completely remove themselves from the electoral process, or do you see some merit in supporting third-party candidates in local politics? I think we have to deal with what we have at the moment. You know, people should be supporting referendums because that's a form of direct, direct democracy. But the aristocracy game that's emerged, which is an outgrowth of basically the economic system, which in which inherently generates hierarchy. This is completely misunderstood. We think that we're in a different paradigm today than we were during the age of kings and queens, but we're really not, except the kings and queens are behind the scenes and they operate within the business industrial enterprise, which is, of course, the driving mechanism of all values and institutions we have. So the figureheads, you know, the elections, the presidents, the Congress, they serve as tools, for lack of a better expression, to perpetuate the real driver of our economic system, which is the monetary market market economy itself. And those values that are there confuse people. And they think that when they go into a voting booth and elect somebody, that they're going to actually change something. But if you look at the historical record, which unfortunately many have not, especially since the beginning of America, very little change has occurred really when it comes to the election of any single individual or the conglomerate actions of the Congress or whatever parliament institution, what have you. And this statistical element is lost, unfortunately. I'm not, this isn't projection to say that, oh, it's just to be cynical, say it doesn't matter if you vote. This is proven. Right. So the effect of these elections is not given the correct gravity because it's very small. I'd say maybe 10 percent is how effective the election of a new president really may be. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and, and then it also serves to disempower and disillusion people into thinking that they do have a choice. And then, of course, every four years, nothing changes. It really is stifling humanity in that sense. Uh, when people look at the current trajectory of the world, it's obvious that we're pretty much on a crash, crash course based on a model of unsustainable growth, Peter. I mean, when people look at global capitalism, some argue that, you know, it's not a free and fair market. If cronyism were removed from the equation, capitalism would work. But I mean, is the two-tiered Justin that we're seeing 
today, the plutocratic governance, an endless war for resources, an inevitability of the capitalist model? Unfortunately, I will have to declare that it is. And I know it's a heated subject and people love to argue with me. I have an endless debate on people that say the state is the problem or regulation and that the market should just be free to do whatever it wants. And I argue back that the market is as free as it ever was. In fact, it's more free, I would say. There, at least in the past, were restrictions on the market economy and how it could influence the aristocracy's decision to basically rule everything through war. And, and again, the things that nothing has changed in this regard, you go back to a few and you have the same tendency. But the idea that there's something that can be regulated on a system that's inherently corrupt, in my view, a system that clearly says that you can get money, have the freedom of money to do whatever you want with it, hence the Supreme Court decision that says that money, spending money for political campaigns is actually equated to free speech. Now, this, this delusion that we've come up with to say that we can spend money for whatever purpose possible and influence anything is at the core of the vast corruption we see. And it's, you can go back to Marx, you can go back to Thorsten Veblen, you can go back to all sorts of thinkers in the early 20th century that despite their criticisms, uh, you, they, they were on to something with this. And it's unfortunate how fast people are to shut down this idea. So, you know, my friend Lee Camp has a famous joke. Uh, we applaud politicians now that come and tell us that they're not going to give us health insurance in America or, you know, <laughs> universal health care in America. Why? Because this delusion of socialism has come forward. So any type of communal attribute, which isn't related to money and the freedom of money, now is being misconstrued as something that will lead to tyranny or oppression. And we have F.A. Hayek and, and uh, Ludwig von Mises and all these economic philosophers that have compounded this notion. And that's one of the core religious ritual, if you will, rituals, if you will, of the political establishment to reinforce this idea that freedom and democracy is equated to money. And this has justified the mass majority of wars. It's justified the general disregard for the, the growing homeless and poverty population in America and across the world. And it's also brainwashed people to, to basically disregard humanity on the global scale to say we have one to three billion people either starving to death or in absolute abject poverty. And we don't care about them because our psychology now is so perverted that we can just dismiss them as some anomaly in this social Darwinistic view that we've concocted for ourselves, which unfortunately goes back to Adam Smith. Yeah, absolutely. It does seem like we are indoctrinated with this line of thinking. Anything alternative to that, Peter, is bad, um, as we learn through pretty much every institution that I've experienced growing up in this country, I'm sure around the world. Why is it that people adhere so strongly to these archaic political and religious institutions in light of the 21st century advancement of technology, the vast knowledge available to expand humanity's collective consciousness? It seems like we constantly regress back to what we're comfortable with, even though they've been proven historically to have uh, monumental failures. Yes. I, I call it a, a move from superstition to science. We've, if you look at the social st structure, it really, it goes back so far and it, it discludes so many modern advancements that people's traditional values are so caught up in the voting process, in the delegation of authority, in the general subservience patterns of the peasants, if you will, which is what the majority of humanity unfortunately is. They accept it because it's what they have always known and what they seen, have seen. And naturally, people fear change. It's no psychological uh, anomaly for that. But I think the big issue here is education. People need to understand what's possible. They understand the root causes of, what, of all the problems out there. They need to understand, really, the prosperity-driven effects that could come from science and technology, not just from the gadgets and everything, but if we actually applied these basic near-empirical principles to social governance, we would end up with a completely new social order you can call it a natural law, resource-based economy, basically taking this construct of what works, like an airplane that flies, we build society like an airplane, as an engineered type of concept, and there's really no other way. We live in an anarchy system. That's the best way to describe it. We, we live in a system where each individual is given this bizarre power to make their own decisions under the assumption that in concert, all, the whole of society is going to work out for itself. Provably false. That's why you have 1% of the population owning 40% of the planet's wealth, because the value system disorder, the psychology generated by the system, completely 
disallows any type of balance to occur in a structural sense. So sustainability and public health, these issues are thrown out the window in this model, not only because of the values you denote and people's fear, but because that the very system itself keeps compounding the same old archaic values and fears over and over and over again. And that is the central problem why the Zeitgeist Movement does everything it can in an educational sense, why I make the films that I do and the media that I do, to really try to drill this home. And also the hope to inspire others out there to begin the same drive. And I could actually talk about a larger project that the movement's working on if you'd like to hear about yeah, it. Yeah, absolutely. Let's, let's get into that in one second. I just wanted to say one more thing. It does seem like it's the fear that really drives us, uh, the fear to not... I guess these archaic institutions, you know, keep us stifled. The fear of control of our own lives, I guess. I mean, when we really do have so much power, uh, Peter, but let's talk about the Zeitgeist Movement. Um, you really advocate action. Really, it's a revolution of the mind, of ideas. How do we stop this global empire from crushing us and the planet, which is pretty much the course that we're currently on? What is the Zeitgeist Movement advocating, and how can people get involved? Yes, I agree with you. It's a revolution of values. That's the real revolution. As far as what people can do, the Zeitgeist Movement attempts to take the lowest grassroots level possible, and we want to get important information, very technically viable, not speculative, out for people to digest. With other programs that we do, apart from our event days, we have numerous event days for awareness. In March, we'll have our Zeitgeist Day event. The global event will be in uh, Los Angeles this year. But we have about 400 sympathetic events all over the world across usually about 70 countries on average. Every time we do this, this will be the fourth year of it. But all of those kind of intellectual exercises aside, there's another project that we're doing called the Global Redesign Institute. This is a very important idea. And what it is, it's a macro-industrial approach to show the world what's possible technically and in a effect alleviate all of the confusions they have about what a designed plan system could be and the type of freedom that really could emerge as opposed to the propaganda of establishment that says that that will lead to tyranny and such. The benefit of such is so vast. For example, in this project we'll take different regions and we're going to show the technical layout of how we could say, for example, in Los Angeles have vertical farms of hydroponics and aeroponics run through desalinization processes and nutrient extraction processes from the ocean so we we would be able to feed organic food to everyone, satisfy the entire population of the city of Los Angeles through these methods, through automated systems. And this technology exists. It's been, it's been largely dismissed as utopian, as that word loves to fly around when you start to talk about taking care of everybody. Uh, but this, stu this stuff is there. And what we're going to do is we're going to map out the entire world through time, through the chapters of the Zeitgeist Movement, to show how every region can be updated in this macro-industrial way to actually resolve the core major problems of poverty, of general disimbalance, resource scarcity, and bring these technological uh, fruits to light. I'll stop there because it can go in much larger <laughs> complex uh, associations sure. as we build this model. It will be a virtual online model that will be viewable, and then we're going to have conferences in partnership with all of our other events that we do annually to show each region what's possible. And I really believe once this possibility comes forward, rather than everybody complaining and being disillusioned by the political establishment and economic establishment, they're going to say this works forget right. complaining be part We're of the solution yeah exactly be part of the solution yes. be part of the community of ideas peter instead of the naysayers and saying what isn't possible we really need to step it up um, and i really appreciate you exploring humanity's capabilities and capacity for change in a good alternative sustainable way peter joseph zeitgeist movement everyone check it out i implore you need to see these films thank you so much for coming on thank you abby i appreciate it Many people are conditioned to not bring up politics and religions. They're confined to their own rigid perspectives fed by biased media outlets. We must begin to challenge this dogma if we ever want to progress our society and evolve the collective human consciousness.